Hello, welcome to Hot Thai Kitchen. So today I'm going to show you how to make Thai red curry paste. Now, I don't always make my own curry paste, but when I do, I can really taste the difference in the flavor and the complexity, and it makes your curry truly unique. Plus, I can control the heat level so it's just right for the people that I'm serving, which is always a struggle with store-bought paste. I have shown you how to make this before, but in this update, I'm going to show you two methods. The easy way, which I use, and the hard but traditional way, so there is something for everyone. Now, if by the end of this video you watch this and you're like, forget it, even the easy one is too much work for me, I will stick to buying, thank you very much. I don't judge, I buy it too, but just make sure you watch first my curry paste review video to make sure that you don't end up buying a bad one. But first, what is a curry paste anyway? Well, in Thai cuisine, a curry paste or prik gang is basically just a mixture of herbs and spices, which you use to flavor, obviously, curries, but also anything else you can think of, stir fries, meat mixture, wherever you would put herbs and spices. Red curry paste or prik gang pet is the most common type. So I like to think of it as the basic curry paste, meaning that it doesn't use any ingredients that are unique to it versus other types that might have like this spice or that herb that makes it unique. So it's very versatile. The flavor pairs well with just about any meat or protein. So it's sort of like the basic tomato sauce in Italian cuisine. Let's talk the most important part ingredients. You've got to have the right ingredients in order for this to taste right. You don't want to be making all sorts of substitutions, otherwise you might as well just buy it. So here is what you need. Dry chilies, lemongrass, galangal, cilantro stems or roots, garlic, shallots, salt, white peppercorns, magrut lime zest, and shrimp paste. So that's what you need and here's how to prep them. Red dried chilies. This is the red in red curry paste. I'm using two types, a mild one for color and flavor and a spicy one for the heat. I'm using two to one ratio of mild to spicy chilies, but you can change this up to customize the heat level. Obviously, it's also going to depend on the heat level of your spicy chilies. For the mild, you can use wahio or buya peppers. They work perfectly. In Thailand, we would use spur chilies. All you need to do is cut them into half-inch chunks and you can discard any seeds that fall out, but there's no need to remove whatever's still inside. For the spicy, I'm using our bowl chilies, but traditionally these would be Thai chilies and you would prep them in the same way as the mild ones. If you can only find spicy dry chilies, you can still use them, but you want to remove all of the seeds and the pith to reduce the heat as much as possible. Remember, you cannot fix a dish that is too spicy, but you can always add more chilies at the end. Lemongrass. I am using the bottom half, which is where the flavor is the strongest. Slice them thinly, especially if you are hand pounding. Frozen lemongrass is fine, but don't use dried or powdered because the flavor is weak and different in those forms. Galangal. Thinly slice into thin rounds, and then finely julienne the rounds into sticks. If you're hand pounding, I would finely chop it even further to save yourself some time. Frozen galangal is fine, but no dried or powdered, again, because the flavors are weak and different in those forms. Then we also have some chopped garlic, shallots, salt, and white peppercorns. As an option, you can also add coriander seeds and cumin seeds, but I prefer not to, and I'll expand on this on the blog post. Cilantro stems, which really should be cilantro roots, but we can't find roots here, so stems will do, and the aroma is pretty much the same. I want to talk about a couple of ingredients that need a bit of explanation. Magrut lime zest. So these are magrut limes. Most of the time you see me use just the leaves, but the leaves are really tough and difficult to grind down into a paste, which is why for this application, we use the zest. And all you need to do is use a knife to slice off the zest and then finely chop it. Now, the limes are very hard to find. I had to go to a specialty store and spend five bucks each for these which really hurt, but I did it for you. So if you only have the leaves, that's okay because the aroma between the lime zest and the leaves are actually very similar. So you can just leave this out of the paste, but then throw a few, in, a few extra leaves into the dish when you are cooking. 
if you don't have the leaves or the the limes you can use regular lime zest and put it in the paste it's not quite the same but it'll work okay finally fermented shrimp paste or kapi which i've been keeping covered until the last moment because otherwise the whole room would smell like shrimp paste and that's not good now this is not to be confused with shrimp paste in oil by the way not the same thing don't want to use them interchangeably this adds a lot of depth and a lot of umami and we add shrimp paste to just about every kind of curry paste that we make if you're vegan you can substitute miso paste instead it's go time first i'm going to show you how i actually make curry paste using electric appliances to make easy work out of it and then i'm going to show you the traditional way which is also a good stress reliever and a workout for the easy method, you're going to need a coffee grinder for the dry stuff. Any cheap one will do. Nothing fancy is required here. For the fresh herbs, I'm going to use an immersion blender. I'm using a Breville, which is a 280 watt model. I have not tried ones that are weaker, so I can't say whether those will get the paste fine enough. But if you have one, it's definitely worth a try. But I will link uh, to the exact model in the description below. Let's do it. Put the chilies into the coffee grinder along with any other dry spices and simply blitz until you've got a fine powder. You'll need to shake it a bit as you go. And no, I don't suggest sharing the same grinder with your coffee beans unless you like spicy coffee. Very important safety note, before you open it, let the dust fully settle. And then when you do open it, don't put your face right on top of it because inhaling chili fumes is not pleasant. Ask me how I know. Now we switch to an immersion blender and you want to use a glass measuring cup or something narrow enough so that the blade will actually reach the herbs. Add all of the fresh herbs into the container and you want to start with the tough herbs and then top it with the garlic and shallots. This is because the garlic and shallots are more moist and after they're blended, they'll provide the moisture needed for the tough herbs to blend properly. You need to press and lift the blender multiple times because this is a low moisture paste, but in just a few minutes, you will have a fine paste. You may need to give it a stir in between. Once it's fine, you're almost there, you can add salt, shrimp paste, and the dried spices. And give it a couple of blitzes just to mix everything together. And that looks just like what you can buy from the store. So that was quick and easy. Now, if you only have a coffee grinder but not an immersion blender, you can still do all your dry stuff in here. And then for the fresh herbs, you switch to the traditional method, which will still save you a ton of time because the thing that takes the most time is the chilies. Now the traditional way, AKA the hard way. For this, you're gonna need a large granite mortar and pestle, okay? Nothing cute or light. If you use that, you're gonna be frustrated and you're gonna end up with a paste that is too coarse. This one is an eight inch in external diameter and a three cup capacity. Works great for the amount that we're making today. And you're also going to need a large volume of patience. Before you start, soak the chilies to soften. Give them at least half an hour, but longer is better because the softer they are, the easier they will be to grind. Drain them and pat them dry. We want to grind the dry spices first. For this recipe, we just have the peppercorns, but coriander and cumin seeds would go in at this point and then remove it for now. Here's the secret. You want to start with the toughest thing and then end with the softest thing. The toughest thing being the dried chilies. And I'm going to add some coarse salt in here, which will help break the chilies down. And you want to pound this into a paste. Once it starts to get wet and slippery, you can add your dry spices in to help absorb some of that moisture. Once it's about 70% fine, you can add all the tough herbs. That's the lemongrass, galangal, the lime zest, and the cilantro stems and then pound it into a paste. When pounding, of course, you gotta hit the center, but you wanna move your pestle around so you're also getting the side and you're almost just sliding the pestle down towards the middle. As a short person, I find it much easier to do this on the floor so I can put more of my weight on it and the Asian squat adds to the authenticity. Once this looks more or less fine, you can add all the soft herbs, which are the garlic and the shallots, and then pound that into a fine paste. 
At this point, the finer, the better. It means you're releasing the maximum amount of flavor from the herbs. If the herbs are still in chunks, the flavors are trapped in those chunks and not released into the curry sauce. A smooth paste also means a smooth texture of the curry, which is what we want. Once you've got a fine paste or once your patience runs dry, whichever comes first, you can add the shrimp paste and just pound it to mix and that is that. So this was about 16 minutes of pounding from start to finish and uh, I think we're at the right place and just as well because my patience had also run out by this point. Um, just one thing I like to note, because I don't do this often, like I'm not an expert, what I would have done differently for this was to actually dry my chilies even better because the more moisture you've got left over from the soaking chilies, the wetter this becomes and the wetter it is, the harder it is to grind. If you've got lots of dry spices like cumin, coriander seeds, things like that, it'll help absorb that moisture. It's not going to be as big of a problem, but if you are not adding dry spices, then the wetness can be a little annoying. Okay, so that's just a tip for next time. Here are our two pastes. This is one that's made using the immersion blender and here's one that we hand pounded. We've got a slightly larger volume with the hand pounding because of the added liquid from the soaking water and also the color's a little bit lighter because of the dilution and also because we lost some color in the soaking water. Okay, now common questions. Why do I use an immersion blender and not a jug blender like this? Well, there are two things that a stick blender is able to do that makes it perfect for our need. One, it can handle low moisture paste. Two, it can process a small amount of stuff. If you use a jug blender, in order for it to blend properly, you need to add extra liquid. Now you've got a runny paste and now it's going to mess with the recipe that you're going to be using it in. Not to mention, you're going to need to make a lot more paste than this amount in order for it to blend properly. And sometimes you don't want to make that much curry paste. A food processor can handle low moisture stuff, but again, you're going to have to make a lot in order for it to work properly. Otherwise, it's all going to stick to the sides and the blade is going to spin. I think we've all been there. Very frustrating. But even if you made a lot, it just will not get the paste fine enough. The nature of the blade just will not give you a smooth curry paste like this. So that's why I think the combination of a coffee grinder and an immersion blender is the best tool for the job. I already mentioned the benefits of homemaking curry paste up top, but let me recap and elaborate on the idea. One, you can customize the heat level. If you buy curry paste and it happens to be too spicy for you, your only option is to use less of it. And that means you're also giving up on all the rest of the herbs and spices, all the flavors, and you end up with a diluted product. It is never a good solution. Two, you can also make it less salty. My constant struggle with store-bought curry paste is that it is so salty that sometimes how much I can add is limited by how salty the paste is. And the reason commercial paste are salty is because they add a lot of salt in order for the paste to last longer without having to add preservatives and all of that stuff. When you make it at home, you don't need it to last longer. You can freeze the paste. You don't have to add any salt to it if you don't want to and then leave all the seasoning at the end. Finally, you can play around with the flavor. Like most foods, everybody's got their own unique recipe. And so what I've given you is not a rule. That's just a guideline. You can change up the amount of ingredients and create your own proprietary blend of curry paste. But the million dollar question is, does it taste better than store-bought paste? Maybe. And I say maybe because when I make my own paste, I think it tastes better than store-bought, but that's because I have the right ingredients, I'm using the right tools. If you're having to make substitutions because you don't have this and you don't have that and the, your paste is too coarse, then maybe it's not going to be better and you're better off buying a good brand of curry paste. And again, I will refer you to my curry paste review video for the good brands you can buy. I do think if you've got access to the right ingredients and the right tools, you should give it a try at least once just to see if you like it better and to see if you enjoy the process. And if you have made your own curry paste before, I'd love to know what you think. Do you think it tastes better than store-bought? Do you enjoy the process? Let us know in the comments.
And that is it. The recipe, as always, is on hotthaikitchen.com with extra info on storage and substitutions and all of that good stuff. And a special thanks to all of our Patreon members who help support the show. If you want to know what that's all about, how you can get direct access to me and watch the show ad-free, you can check out the link in the description below. Thank you as always for watching, and I will see you next time. Sawatika!